I'd like to start by a very short story that some of you may be already familiar. Imagine you're sitting in a plane. There's been a horrible accident, engines fail. About 15 minutes, plane will crash. There's no chance of survival. However, there are some parachutes, untested, highly risky, and people are asked whether they want to try one without any guarantees. What would you do? If you don't do it, no harm, it will be over soon. This, of course, relates to chronics. And I think we are mostly a room of convinced people. That's maybe how you see people who uh, are not interested in it, who refute it, outwardly. And maybe you cannot understand that. It's also how I see chronics, mostly. I have to say, I came from the uh, biomedical field. I'm a biochemist by training. I'm mostly interested in life science. Um, I've known Aubrey in the background for 15 years now. Translated this book, Ending Aging, about 10 years ago. And it's only last year I've been a passive member of uh, Chronics uh, Associations. It's only last year that I thought, let's do something. Switzerland has no organization, no crystallization nucleus. So we, CryoSwiss, founded this association early last year. It's our first conference, and I beg your pardon if not everything uh, works perfectly well. We already have some difficulties technically, I will get to that a little bit later. But we already have uh, participants from 13 countries, and I urge you to take this word literally. Participants, take part, be a part of it. <coughs> it's not us, Triaswiss, who are the most important, not even the speakers, sorry, but it's you, the networking. Use it, exchange yourself, and uh, if you meet someone and want to, even after the conference, take up contact, you have the participants lists, uh, but we did not put email addresses in there or anything specific due to uh, data protection reasons, but we are happy to be the matchmaker in that respect. Then what I also have to do um, is make a few organizational remarks, of course. Uh, most important, but also most boring, is the door. It's the weekend, it's a nice location, but you cannot get in if there are any smokers amongst you or so. You have to wave hands there, you have to give signs, and there's a button left of the door. And please, anybody, feel free to push it so that people can circulate in and out. The restrooms are just behind you, on the right, and we also have a coffee room there for the breaks with uh, <coughs> tea, coffee, chocolate, nuts, whatever. <coughs> and uh, please, it's self-service. We cannot handle uh, the full room for every break. Uh, just take what you need there. In the fridge, there are also some uh, beverages. You will see that uh, in the wine bottles. The other things there are private from the companies who are also in this building here. <coughs> right, then there are a few uh, people amongst you who have not paid yet the uh, conference fee. You can do that in cash today. The speakers are excluded, of course. Um, and our cashier, is, uh, our treasurer, is sitting outside. That's Dominic Boca. Uh, you have met him when he came in. Then the live stream that we have announced to the speakers that would film this part here does not work. We tested it last week, but uh, quite some of you are using the bandwidth, it seems, currently, and it does not work. Maybe it's getting better over the day. Let's see. <coughs> uh, but otherwise, we cannot guarantee it yet. Good. With that, uh, I'd like to switch to a short introduction of Priceless itself and the first uh, program item. We will have short country presentations at the beginning, before lunch, and also after lunch a bit. And 
Priceless was founded in February 2015 and has already 18 members, which I think is quite good progress. <coughs> and I think there's someone called Kevin in the room. Okay. Number 19? Yes, I would say. Excellent. <laughs> And uh, the uh, Cryosphere Association <coughs> is open also for international members. You can be uh, a Swiss game in the majority currently, <coughs> non Swiss of our members. I can shortly um, present uh, my fellow board members. We have uh, Nikolai Kilian, who is uh, my vice president. We have Dominic Wokka in the background mentioned before, treasurer. And we have Typhoon Chichek, the entrance to the kitchen, <laughs> responsible for social media and communication. We are still embryonic in a way. Uh, we have a web page, we have a logo that I like quite a lot. And we have regular meetings in Basel only, if it's closest to us, monthly. Not much more. We don't have any equipment or a standby team. That's all for the future. But we think and are convinced that Switzerland is a good place for chronics, um, at least to three different reasons. One is uh, that we think that we can target a storage facility in Switzerland in the future. Switzerland is very safe. It's very uh, stable also socially, economically, and all that. And there are lots of unused facilities in the Alps that the uh, military doesn't need anymore. So this would be a goal of us to uh, evaluate that possibility, whether it's possible to uh, purchase something like that. Another reason why Switzerland may be a, a good location is that the law is quite liberal with regards to uh, getting alive, to getting not alive anymore. We will hear more about that during the talks. And optimally, it's not something that we put on our web page, of course, but optimally would be if you could really plan it, to have a um, <coughs> process that would allow a perfect uh, preservation and not having an accident or anything else. <coughs> we have already done a so-called showstopper analysis legally. Um, we engaged some lawyers just to check very superficially where there are any roadblocks there and there weren't, which is good. And we had a few appearances already in the, in the media, uh, TV, the biggest Swiss newspaper also. So there's some few initial successes. I used the word matchmaker before and I think Cryosuis can also fulfill that role within Europe to be a matchmaker amongst different uh, country organizations and we will have a part of the program in Sunday afternoon um, that will cover that topic. Now we are already a little bit behind in schedule. We have the country presentations. And I hope the switch works nice. We had a microphone, but I think it's not even necessary in, in this small room. Mm. You can see quite clearly. <coughs> There's also a laser pointer for the people who come up after me here. To the left. So first, some use slides, by the way, some don't. So don't be confused by that. First, we have Germany, presented by Thorsten Hahn. Um, I have the honor of presenting our uh, German organization. Um, let's see if everything works with the slides. Nico. Uh, okay. So, here we go. Wonderful. So, other the group is called Chronics Germany. It seems like many groups are like Chronics UK and so on, so we thought it would feel, fit well with the naming scheme. Um, we're in a way a young and in another way a rather old group. Uh, we founded uh, ourselves in 2015 
but based on a network reaching back to 2004. So there were uh, many people who had known each other for a long time. And um, we formed as a group of friends. So we're not incorporated in any way. We don't have a legal organization that may come over time. But we thought the most important uh, thing was to have a group of people who trusted each other uh, to work together to improve <coughs> the state of economics in Germany. And in a way, also in Austria, but uh, that's, uh, we don't have any members there. So we're a quite small group of 20 members, but uh, what's different is that there is, uh, the members are very active. So I just, when I was putting this together uh, yesterday, I looked through all the names and I'm like, okay, I know all of these from recent discussions on the mailing list. So uh, in a way, it's a group which is doing quite a bit and uh, we'll come to that uh, with some of the next slides. So as I mentioned, there's an active mailing list. We meet around two times a year. Uh, for like a face-to-face uh, meetup uh, when we use our space on the equipment. And we're very fortunate to count among our members uh, two physicians, that is two doctors, and one embalmer, which of course helps us quite a bit with readiness. <coughs> and this is what I'll come um, to next. First, let me say a bit about the situation, uh, sort of to the, Patrick asked us to say a bit about what's the legal situation. And uh, he also already gave us a bit of an idea of what's it like in Switzerland. In Germany, unfortunately, it's not that favorable to crownings. Uh, because official death only occurs once one of the sure signs of death, as it's defined in Germany, has been observed. Uh, this would be, for example, rigor mortis or liver mortis. So these are signs that the body is really shut down and they usually take around 30 minutes to two hours after cessation of heartbeat, um, which, include, uh, which then necessitates quite a bit of a waiting time with warm ischemia. So really not a bad, uh, good starting situation. And also there's no such thing as assisted suicide as we obviously have in the Netherlands or in Belgium or in some parts of the US, which could also be used for trauma. However, and this is always the big caveat, the one thing is the laws, and the other thing is, of course, what, uh, what happens in practice. And our experience has been that, uh, uh, in, that in practice, hospitals can be quite accommodating. They understand that this is a patient who is terminal, that they really want this for themselves. They do, of course, understand that uh, if, if prior preservation is to be successful, then it needs to uh, be initiated immediately, as soon as possible. And so in practice, the experience we've made is that hospitals are much more lenient than would be suggested by law. They might even allow pre-mortal cooling to start already. But of course, this is on a case-by-case -case basis. It needs to be negotiated and not something which we really like because that means the individual outcome of the case can be quite different. Um, from yeah, depending on where uh, which hospital you go to. The one good thing is that the storage of patients is possible, at least that's what our lawyers tell us. Um, there's also been a book published uh, two years ago, a really interesting it was part of a dissertation where a young student looked at the chronic situation in Germany and co authored the book together with uh, Professor of Medicine and Professor of Law. And uh, they looked at different aspects and came to the conclusion that uh, storage would be possible in Germany. And they even said that this sort of uh, elective private innovation <coughs> would be possible, at least it would be um, uh, compatible with the German, um, what? Uh, would be possible uh, together with the German constitution, but the uh, prospective <coughs> laws need to be passed. So we'll have to see how much time we invest on trying to do some lobbying there. Finally, let's look a bit at the practice. And, um, oh, okay, I see it's switched out of the presentation. Okay, <coughs> so um, what we have is we've got a quite, uh, quite big set of equipment which we've acquired over the last years. This uh, includes um, an high scalp, uh, a Lucas One as a thumper, then uh, solutions around uh, which we got uh, candy from Kranich Institute, uh, so full complement, which would be enough for two full body uh, preservations. 
Um, and of course, it includes things like temperature uh, sensors. Uh, you can see a bit of the stuff over here, uh, just such standard medical items, carrying blankets, stretcher, all this sort of thing. So we feel we have a basic state of readiness, but of course, we're not as well trained as uh, other groups. So we look towards, uh, well, especially cooperation with Crown UK uh, for assistance, so if there's a case in Germany, uh, that we can cooperate there. And all the equipment, at least, at least the basic equipment, uh, is on site already. Um, we do have an extensive manual of procedures, which one of our members put together, which really details all the steps uh, pre, standby, standby, and afterwards. So all together for a group of volunteers, uh, I think we're doing quite well, but still there's lots of room to improve as we move to uh, professional drive preservation. Finally, sort of as a wrap up, uh, I wanted to stress that we, uh, yeah, we really like to cooperate with the other groups. We see there's a quite an upswell of chronics in Europe at the moment, and I'll expand on that a bit more in a, a talk uh, tomorrow. So we're in regular contact with ARCA and CI. When we can make the time, we join <coughs> the campaign training sessions. And uh, we've uh, tried to help with European cases as uh, they arise. And uh, two of our members have already uh, joined in two cases which happened in the UK uh, this year and last. And so we look forward to discussing with you and working with you. And I want to thank, of course, Creo Swiss for putting together this event and we really look forward to it. Thank you. Taking questions? Okay. Taking questions? Um, Not time. Maybe at the end or during lunch time, <laughs> which is a kind of time. Okay. Well, this is UK with Penn Gibson. And yeah, I'm Tim Gibson, Chronics UK. I'm going to do this the way we do our standbys. I've prepared nothing. I have no plan. I'm just going to turn up and see how it goes. Um, so essentially, Chronics UK started off, or should I say, the core of the people started off as Alcor UK. I believe Garrett was number one. In the early days, he's looking around. Yeah. He's not one and one. And one. Matt, well, okay. Matt and I were. Around, okay, yeah. So, when was that? Mid 80s or? 86. 86. Yeah, so a long time ago. Um, <coughs> over the years, the names have changed, the people have moved around, but essentially, the core group is now Chronix UK, uh, originally based on the south coast with Alan Sinclair looking after everything. Uh, Alan's getting on a whip bit now, about 78 or something, still going strong. Uh, he always pretends to be younger, doesn't he? <laughs> um, and now, basically, I'm looking after everything in Sheffield. Um, essentially, nothing happened in terms of real cases for quite a long time. Um, we just plodded along, gathering members, doing training. Alcohol gave us a lot of help in terms of equipment and, and also coming over to do training. Um, and I think our first case came around 2000, and then the next one not till 2008. And then all of a sudden, about three years ago, they rolled in and now we've got up to 11 in the space of a few years. <coughs> and the last one only a couple of weeks ago. Um, in terms of membership, that we, although there's about 130, 150 people in the UK with arrangements, uh, we only have 50 members, or slightly less. So we're not quite sure what the others are going to do when they go. And perhaps they're going to find the funeral director and they'll pop out in six hours' time. But you know, that's another issue. Um, <laughs> Um, where are we from there? In terms of whether we're allowed to do what we, we want to do, <coughs> the answer is pretty much yes. Um, there's no laws in relation to Chronix directly. Um, and to be honest, from recent sort of, what's the phrase, um, connections with the law, shall we say, there appears to be no willingness of, on the part of the courts to make any decisions on Chronix. They're just willing to let it go and not interfere. Um, the only real complications we have are dealing with hospitals who have policies that they set, which are nothing to do with the law, it's just their policy. So we either persuade them to step beyond their policy or twist their policy, or more often we rely on individuals just to do the right thing, which appears to be what happens in Germany. Um, so for example, in one case they said, you're not coming into the hospital. In another case, they let us wheel the ice bath up to the side of the patient's bed and sit in the next room. Uh, in one hospital, we sat with the patient for a week. Um, and then, again, we have various arrangements with pronouncements. 
Some people are very quick, although the official guidelines say you make an assessment of vital signs, you wait five minutes, you check them again, then you pronounce. What in reality happens with a lot of doctors is they walk up, they go, yeah, dead. <laughs> and I think the quickest pronouncement we've had is probably over 30 seconds by a paramedic with an ECG. And you just put the sensors on, step back, yep, yeah, gone, pulled off the printout, and walked away. Uh, and that was, in that case, we'd actually taken the patient out of the house, we'd got him down the stairs into the ice bath, and we'd barely dropped him in the ice bath. The paramedic walked in, pronounced, and we carried on as if nothing had happened. Um, other matters, or other cases we've had where we've been essentially allowed to start before pronouncement. So we assess the vital signs, we start cardiac support, ventilation, ice cooling. The only thing we can't do is invasive treatment like applying drugs. Uh, so then once we have the pronouncement, we can then start the drugs, it's as simple as that. So essentially we can start stabilizing the patient straight away. Um, I could go on for hours, so I think that's enough for now. <laughs> um, I missed anything there. I'm losing track. We'll um, be back on uh, later this afternoon anyway. We'll go yeah, we'll be back on this afternoon. We have got our ambulance with us, uh, which is a sh well, shiny new one to us, uh, because the last one actually broke down on the way to the case. Uh, but we got there in the end. In fact, this is an interesting twist. Because this is the hospital that told us we couldn't come in. So when we turned up with a van instead of an ambulance, we said, we can't do anything in our van, there's no room. We'll have to do it in the street. And the hospital went, oh, no, you better come in the hospital. <laughs> so uh, there's always ways to cheat the system. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, in Italy, we are uh, really at a very initial stage. We are an association. Uh, the association was planned this year, so uh, and it's uh, still very small. We have only three active members and a few others that, are, uh, that have a sporadic participation. The only positive point is that those three active members who are medical doctors. And uh, in terms uh, of uh, uh, aims, we had uh, since since. Italy is a very traditional country where the idea of clinics is very hard to accept. Uh, we have to, to uh, try to foster, a, let's say, uh, an approach where we, the aim of the, of the association is to foster uh, survival practices, to uh, uh, consider cryonics as the future extension of what is done now when a person has a strong uh, a nerve attack, stroke, and then he dies, and, and then you apply some techniques for keeping, uh, for preserving his body while you try to reanimate him. In that case, the person is, uh, is not yet officially declared dead, but let's say 50 years ago would have been declared uh, dead in such a case. But you still uh, try to reanimate him. And, and, uh, uh, and you try to preserve the body with uh, cooling and uh, with circulating uh, cooling liquid in order to, to preserve his body and to see if the mission is successful. So we are saying that cryonic is at a certain extent an, an extension of this, where you still try to, to, to uh, preserve the body in a condition where uh, that is now the person is considered dead nowadays, but probably uh, we see that the definition of death can, can change with time somehow. And so we, we, we promote, let's say, we promote the approach, this type of approach, rather than focusing on cryonics only. That's the, the only way to make it more acceptable, let's say. There are other associations in Italy for cryonics, there are some, uh, what I call the wild cryonics members, people like uh, Vito, that they, uh, they are interested in uh, cryonics, but are not in contact with uh, any association yet. And uh, we, we, we intend uh, to establish collaboration as much as possible with those people, also to reach a critical mass that we don't have at the moment. Yet. Okay, this I, I already said this, the idea of uh, uh, promote health preservation for resusc resuscitation practices. Uh, 
and uh, the idea of uh, building critical mass. We have a uh, uh, intention, aims of the association is also to solve uh, legal and practical issues that are associated with standby, uh, standby practice, provide standby services, things that we don't know, and then the aim will be also to to support the creation of a European storage facility if this would be possible. We don't have services, so in this case, this is quite fast. <laughs> uh, we are looking for collaboration with external parties like funeral home and, and Balmers, but we, this is still in progress. Uh, legal situation, there is a famous joke, I will not waste your time, saying that in Italy, uh, Italy is a country where uh, a lot of things are forbidden, but almost everything is tolerated. So in the gray area, you can do almost everything. I'm rather surprised to, to notice that the, the situation in other countries is not that different from, from this one. So, but, uh, so, so we have the same, uh, same problem, that the collaboration of hospital is important, of course, the collaboration, the, the results are not objective, not, not always the same, it depends on from the attitude of people and how much, how able you are to navigate in those gray areas where, where uh, things are tolerated. Declaration of death re requires uh, 20 minutes with the uh, ECZ, or 24 hours of circulation, so it's much longer than, than in other countries, unless you have an ECZ system available. And what we are trying to understand, but this is not easy to have an official answer to that, is if life-saving practices like ECMO, Lucas, or cooling of the body are compatible with this observation period that would partially solve the problem. But it's extremely difficult to have a no official answer on that because everybody is providing. I can tell you that if you put a lupus on the patient, it will interfere with the ECG. So yeah. you won't get a proper yeah, reading. Yeah, yeah, correct. <coughs> yeah. But, but not for the 24 hour observation period. So that, that is much longer. But again, uh, we, we, have a, we have a similar feeling that in some cases, as far as we have seen, doctors don't really wait for 24 hours or so, but then. Again, the problem is we don't have a clear official answer on the basis of which you can apply a structural process that is always repeatable. It depends on case to case and uh, person to person that is not a very desirable situation. Only burial and burning on incineration are allowed, so, uh, and, and again, uh, it's not clear whether perfusion can be considered the equivalent to embalming in, in, uh, in uh, and, and perfusion and cooling can be considered equivalent to embalming. Depending on if there are some, some uh, let's say, hidden aspect of the law that could uh, probably allow to do that. Uh, I, I personally, we have the feeling that either Italy is not the best place for storage facility, just for public perception of cryonics, but uh, in any case, the storage facility are, are treated as private graveyard and with the same required uh, private graveyards. Uh, we are fully open for, for uh, collaboration and uh, we have uh, the opportunity, uh, thanks to in Gibson to, to participate uh, to a practice course of King Gibson. And uh, as Italian, uh, we are uh, <laughs> <laughs> very good ideas. So the only problem is that uh, sometimes we have difficulties in putting them in practice, especially because everybody is promoting his own ideas. <laughs> so we, we try to, uh, let's say, give a little bit of formality to the process of uh, uh, standby processes to, starting from the beginning we consider it for the different option of what may happen and the treatment that are available and uh, we identified uh, in the blue the areas where we have legal problems that are described in yellow the areas where we have uh, legal and technical problems or we where we observe the legal and technical problem and try to 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 describe all the possible path from that to, to preservation in this way in order to solve the different problems in a, in a let's say, 
logical way. Uh, we are this preparing a crowdfunding initiative for the realization of the standby service. And, uh, and of course, we have this strong interest uh, for European storage facility and ready to contribute. Thank you. Thank you, Roberto. We are working this time until now. Um, next poll is Belgium. Anthony Lambert. Yes. So I didn't bring slides, so I could bring my cheat sheet. So good morning. Uh, thank you, first of all, Patrick and uh, Bryce, in general, for having me and organizing this great event. It's great to see so many nations represented and uh, see some familiar faces again as well. So about Belgium, I can be uh, pretty short and sweet. I'd say in general we have the critical service in place, but not in fancy. That's how I would summarize it. So um, essentially, the Quantics organization in Belgium started about in 2003. Uh, it was led by a person named David uh, Verbeke, uh, and it started off as an MSN group. So now this person has faded back a little bit more to the background, and these days what is known as Chronics Belgium is essentially led by Eric uh, Bourgeois, um, who runs the website. So this website is unfortunately also a little bit, um, well, let's say it's not mobile friendly, it's not uh, up to date with design standards in uh, but, uh, website practices, but we're looking at uh, renewing it and so forth. Um, we have about 10 members. Uh, so when I say 10 members, I mean there are 10 people actually signed up with CI in Belgium because there is no official organization, which is like a loose association as well. About these 10 members, interestingly enough, there's also three uh, children. Uh, there's actually one uh, dad who uh, uh, signed up his three kids. I think the oldest one is about 12 or 13 now. Uh, correspondence is pretty informal. Um, we have a Google group these days. MSN groups are not so fancy anymore, I think. Um, but I, I notice that some people are quite um, reluctant to, to discuss. I haven't even met everyone yet, unfortunately. Um, and I do try to meet occasionally with other members, but it's usually like little ones-on-ones. And uh, it's almost more because we have, you know, you personally know. Um, so, Interesting enough, though, uh, very recently we had our first case of someone being suspended. Uh, a 90-year-old lady passed away and was brought over to CI and preserved there. Um, interestingly enough, as well, she was not actually signed up before that. She was signed up sort of last minute by her sons, uh, who are also interested in crime, but are not signed up themselves either. So it seems that we have some people who are on the fence in Belgium. Um, so our numbers are small, but they're also a bit underrepresented, apparently. So this case um, of this lady, it spilled over into the news. We have been um, you know, we have been in the newspaper before. I think Eric has done an interview or two in the past. Um, and essentially, the, uh, let's say the media is neutral to carefully positive about mm -hmm. chronics in Belgium, which is quite refreshing. Uh, we even had our funeral director, more about that later, but he actually um, took part in a television show where he was uh, deeply interviewed. It was a pretty long show. It was not like this one minute thing. It was actually, I think, a 20 or 30 minute show. So it was quite interesting and did it uh, very well. And I learned that also so the news about this recent passing away also spilled over into the Netherlands where it has taken on a life of its own. That's something I only learned yesterday night. So then, then about the services, and as you can get, they were recently stress tested. Um, we worked together with a funeral director named Doms, um, who's uh, also skilled in embalming, and as it turns out, that's not that different from using a perfusion solution. And uh, he's also well versed in transporting bodies, so that has turned out to be quite useful. And uh, with regards to this lady specifically, uh, so she was legally proclaimed that in a hospital by a doctor. Uh, it took a few hours uh, before she was brought to the funeral director where um, basically the, you know, the replacement with the cushion classification solution started rather quickly. And then I think it took about two days to uh, bring her over to Michigan where she was uh, preserved at CI. 
So um, that also brings us to what we have in Belgium. Um, it's minimal, but like I said, we have the critical things in place. So we used to have enough electrification solution for one person, so that stock has, has now been uh, consumed, but we have ordered two more sets, um, as well as a uh, coffin to actually transport the body abroad. Um, so legally, Crinex, I mean, the, the act of um, Preserving the body, or at least you know, doing the chain of petrification solution, is allowed. Actual storage is not. We even have, uh, recently had a discussion about that. Um, essentially, it's the same as the Netherlands. So um, you either go to a graveyard, or you donate donate your body for um, basically for doctors to practice on. <laughs> so um, also interesting enough, uh, by default in Belgium, everyone is an organ donor. So it's important for Belgian crisis to actually get yourself off the donor list if you want to make it in one hole to the uh, CI. <coughs> Obviously, if you were signed up with Alcor uh, or you know, just the health preservation, that would be an issue. Um, let me see. Oh, all right. Uh, Belgium, interesting enough, was also one of the first <coughs> countries to have uh, euthanasia legalized. So, technically, it should be possible to have a suicide. And um, I think those are the main points. If you have any more questions, uh, don't hesitate to reach out, and I'll be happy to try and answer your questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, from Sweden, we have uh, Oke okay, Pranström, who represents his country. <laughs> Cryonics organization is uh, certainly the smallest and also the least capable of all you heard so far. So we were formed uh, this spring by four members, of uh, which only two actually have uh, cryonics arrangements in place. So we have uh, sadly no equipment, we have no training, and also no high flying ideas. <laughs> <laughs> All we have is uh, a website, a Facebook group, and a willingness to provide advice to anyone who uh, is interested in learning more about cryonics and how to sign up. Uh, there's never been a cryonics case in Sweden as far as we know, and we just really have no clue how it would work out in practice, but we do not foresee any big obstacles. So a physician can pronounce that, and it's seems to be uh, fairly straightforward. It can even be done over the phone with the help of a nurse in some cases. It's also quite standard to transport uh, disease nowadays for burial in other countries. So um, it should probably work out okay. And then a slight drawback, uh, embalming is not so common in Sweden. It's only done in the major cities, and then it's done by government employees in the government healthcare system. So that could potentially be one obstacle. Uh, in terms of uh, having actual storage facilities in Sweden, the law is not so favorable. So only burial and cremation are allowed. We can <coughs> donate to the government healthcare system for scientific purposes. Uh, so we don't think that that would work out. Assistant suicide is also not uh, allowed in Sweden. So that's another drawback. And autopsies are sometimes done, especially if it's some strange circumstances, if it's a young person that dies. So that could also cause problems. But overall, we think it's uh, practically doable with cryonics in Sweden as long as we actually then store <coughs> some of that, like uh, Cryonics Institute or Alpha, whatever the may, case may be. Um, yeah, so um, clearly we're very much in the early startup phase, as you heard from my description here. But we're here to learn, and uh, we're happy, or I'm happy for any advice that you might have. So I'm looking forward to discussing with you for the coming days. Thank you. We have two counter presentations left. Mm -hmm. You both wanted to have the last spot. Since I'm Swiss, I'm always a neutral, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Poland and Spain. You're Speaker is not here. Well, no, no. I know the member is not here, but we can go because probably he will only. We can go okay. because he will come only at 12. 
Ah, okay. So I think uh, it should be okay. So we'll have spade next. Thank you. First of all, I would like to thank the organizer for doing such a great event and having here so many people from different countries uh, talking and cooperating to make CryoX uh, possible for, for, for all of us. Uh, thank you very much. My name is Gonzalo Ruiz and I'm one of the members of Vida Plus Foundation, a life extension organization based in Spain. We are not the only ones talking about cryonics in our country, but we try to get together all serious efforts and serious people uh, interested in, in this area. Our aim is to get the best support from different sectors to make cryonics and other life extension goals possible with the rigor and seriousness that these objectives need. Well, I begin explaining to you what we are. As I said before, our members are organized under the legal entity of a foundation. With a plus foundation acts as an umbrella figure that coordinates the efforts of different uh, organizations and projects. On one hand, for example, we have uh, Vita Plus. Vita Plus is a, a facility uh, offering services uh, to cryopreserve the stem cells from newborns umbilical cords. And we have here Techo Mazuelas, his CEO and founder. On the other hand, on the other hand, we have a research uh, project led by uh, two, uh, two, two people, Javier Cabo and Ramon Risco. These projects are uh, related with the development of novel technologies for cryopreservation of human organs and embryos. Uh, in the future, we look forward uh, to develop uh, full body cryopreservation and other life extension uh, activities that we include in this box called Bridge to Animal Life. And regarding to who we are, uh, we have uh, we've tried to get together uh, different experts and influencers in, in our country. <coughs> Among us, uh, we have our inspirational leader, ambassador and president, Jose Luis Cordero, Jose Luis from Singularity University is a well-recognized and well-known uh, futurist. and He has received uh, several awards for promoting research in longevity extension. Together in our team, we also have Ramon Tamames, one of the fathers of the Spanish constitution and a big influencer in our country. Javier Cabo is a world uh, top uh, leader in heart transplant and heart <coughs> cry preservation. Uh, Felipe de Baza, PhD in law and history, is professor in uh, Rey Juan Carlos University in Spain, Madrid. And Chechu Mazuelas is the CEO and founder of Vida Plus Stem Cell uh, Preservation uh, Company. And in our group, we have uh, several, uh, several people uh, that provide us support in different areas. And, and a business developer, for example, uh, we have uh, research uh, leadership and also financial advisory. Yeah, and we have, uh, with all of these uh, people, we have international connections, we have financial and business experience, we have influence in different areas to try to get positive uh, public uh, opinion from the government, from the university, from the media too. We have law advisory and we have medical and research leadership. And you can see here, for example, some of our meetings, some of our activities and even some media coverage about, uh, about us. We have been having meetings with uh, important people in our country, influencers, for example. Uh, we have here a picture with Maria Blaster, who is one of the uh, most important uh, researchers uh, right now in our country. Maybe She's a friend also of Aubrey de Grey yeah. and some other people here. She's one of the candidates for the uh, uh, Nobel Prize in uh, Physiology. She has been able to extend the life of mice three times. Those mice are called the triple because uh, they have a, a good condition uh, uh, with telomerase treatment. Thank you. And regarding with the ecosystem in Spain, as I said before, we are not the only ones talking about cryonics. We are in contact with other groups, for example, uh, cryonica.org, that is a website that tries to offer um, information uh, to all these people interested in B cryoprocharge. And we are also in contact with medical centers, with emergency services, with insurance companies, with funeral homes, with private container, but uh, we, uh, we, we are looking for, for developing uh, cryo preservation, full body cryo preservation. And as I said before, cryonica.org is a non-profit non organization that tries to uh, offer uh, comprehensive information and assistance 
to those that are interested in, in the topic. Uh, and it has hundreds of members internationally, not only in Spain, but all over the Spanish-speaking world, including California and Texas, down to Argentina. So we have hundreds of people who have been following all these news. Exactly. And we're in contact also with uh, some companies that are trying to do uh, also things in, in cryonics. For example, uh, G-Biomed is a company that is trying to build uh, cryo capsules uh, in order to cryopreserve tissues, cells, or organs, and even full bodies. And it's remarkable to say that already three uh, Spanish people are cryopreserved. Two of them are in Alcor in USA, and one of them <coughs> in Germany. Uh, the one in Germany, I don't know if you want yeah, to speak I, I, in the I, term. Uh, technology and infrastructure obstacles in order to at least start to prepare the bodies for the further cryo preservation uh, process. And what we are looking for, we are looking for a partnership uh, to develop a full body cryo preservation uh, in Spain as soon as possible. And we think that uh, to have a deal, to have an agreement with uh, existing facilities is the best way to to get uh, this result. And we also think that cooperation with other countries, with international groups is very important to make cryonics possible not only in Spain but in the entire world. Um, finally, let me finish with this uh, slide that is uh, Spain and cryonics make sense. Uh, we already have uh, some <coughs> good things. Uh, we have medical experience, we have uh, some potential patients and customers, we have financial support, we have in our group uh, business experience and legal advisory, but we still need uh, help to develop full body cryopreservation in Spain. We need a partnership with a current facility, an existing facility, and we need to cooperate with international groups, as I said before, to make projects possible. And finally, uh, we would like to announce that we are organizing an international cryonics summit in, in Spain next year. It will be a close event for professionals uh, in May, the weekend of the 27th and the 28th. And we will continue with an open event for the, for the, for the general public to begin to build this uh, positive public opinion uh, in Madrid, in Sevilla, and Barcelona. And all of you are invited, of course, and it would be an honor to have all of you again in our country talking and cooperating to make cryonics possible. And that's all. Uh, here you have our contact information. We are going to uh, be here for the whole Congress. Uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gonzalo, for that. This uh, presentation can, by the way, also be found on YouTube. I saw that. Very nice to done. So, last presentation is from uh, Professor Christoph Hellmann from Poland. So, good morning, everybody. First, I'd like to thank you very much, Patrick, for the uh, invitation. Uh, let me let me introduce myself first. Uh, I am a professor of surgery and oncology at the Cancer Center in California. I'm interested in cryonics uh, for more than 10 years, uh, but also I'm very interested in uh, modern uh, medical technologies and uh, in, in cosmology. So I'm going to uh, say something about uh, Cryonics in Poland. There are not too many information about it because there is no any artificial structure, there is no any standby team or other services in Poland. Uh, there is also uh, a known number of people who are interested in cryonics. And I'm afraid that just popular knowledge about the cryonics in Poland is uh, close to zero. Uh, we have uh, a similar situation uh, with legal procedures uh, compared to the other countries. It's not <coughs> clear. That means, for example, that the confirmation of, uh, of, of the death is very easy. But sometimes we need a long time to proceed the, the, all these proceedings, more than 24 hours, and during the weekend, then much more. And it's not very uh, clear what we can do with the body after the death. But uh, generally, we can just uh, do the same uh, as in the other European country. I'm afraid also that uh, the social acceptance about crimes is low or very low. 
and uh, we can expect uh, a possible counteracting uh, from the church and from the politicians, special, especially uh, populistic politicians. So uh, uh, there are negatives of the current policy, but there are also some positives. We have a web website, Guernica.org.pl, going on from 2014, and during uh, this time uh, we had uh, over 12,000 visitors. Unfortunately, up to now, this is one in drop. But we have uh, uh, an organization which I call For Future Foundation. This organization is under construction, it's ready to register in Poland. But we stopped it for a moment because I have another idea which I'm going to present it in the next minutes. There is uh, one, uh, I think, uh, very experienced organizer uh, with medical scientific business <coughs> and me, I'm sorry. We have uh, some significant sub uh, financial support, very significant, which is very important. And we are the group of very influential people who are interested in the development and support of grants. So those, uh, this information about the Polish grants is uh, very little information. But uh, because uh, I will be not able to to take part in tomorrow afternoon session, I would like to say a little bit more about the for Future Foundation. So let me change the slides. So, uh, the most important thing for our foundation is of course the longevity, right activity, strong economic flexibility, and good management. And I would like to uh, briefly talk about first uh, three points. Uh, strong economy is very important because without money we will uh, not go any progress. Of course, small donations are important, but uh, from my point of view, the big donations, and uh, therefore uh, we are talking with, with uh, different, very rich people in Poland, but only in Poland. And we, uh, we are thinking about their influence uh, on management and for their exceptional interest. The other resources are from the tax uh, allowance and maybe in future from the business activity. But anyway, strong economy is very important. Uh, longevity. I, uh, we think that such a foundation uh, should have a quasi-successional character. That means that uh, the main uh, donors should have an influence for uh, the future. And therefore, the legal successor, for example, familiar uh, successor, uh, should be allowed. Uh, Safe and peaceful, peaceful location is very important for the longevity, good reputation, strong economy, of course, and right management. The, another, and, uh, one more point is the right activity. I think that, uh, and therefore we stopped uh, with the process of registration now in Poland, because we think that uh, mm -hmm. such a foundation, such, such organization should uh, active uh, not only in one country, but in different or maybe in all European countries. I use the word pan-European extent of activity. So we can consider two situations, just to register such a foundation in uh, uh, one European country with possible of activity in different countries, or to register in several countries. <coughs> so therefore, this foundation should uh, uh, should be the same. I mean, it should be one foundation in different countries. And I think that uh, foundation uh, should uh, also, um, uh, it, uh, the multi structure organization is very, very important for the foundation. Uh, all the uh, legal documents are ready, and I would like to show you only two or three slides about it. Because uh, Cryonics or just uh, biostatics is not enough for such a uh, for other goals, I think so. 
therefore the basic goal is just uh, uh, different activities and, uh, and improving the quality and length of human life, not only in Taiwan. But <coughs> of course, these goals uh, should be achieved uh, to the different activity and uh, also uh, improving the quality of uh, land of human life, uh, uh, including uh, biostatics and climate also. But of course, science, uh, research, uh, business, etc. Everybody who is interesting, I can uh, I can copy this uh, status. The very important is management, and therefore uh, we think that, uh, and that here you have some information about the main foundation councils, because the main donors, uh, it means uh, people who made the main donation, I mean really big money, they should have the uh, real influence for the activity, and they, uh, I think, should have the possibility to uh, to, 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 to change uh, their will into the next successors, for example, mm -hmm. indicated from the family, from other, other members. So this is very important from my point of view when we are thinking about the longevity. Uh, as I am not going to be tomorrow, I uh, also would like to, this is the last my slide, to tell you about what is my imagination about the first steps after registration such organization, in, not only in Poland, but also maybe in other countries. Most important thing is just to cooperate, to cooperate with uh, other organizations, especially with uh, those who have uh, storage facility. The another step is to organize uh, standby teams in several parts of Europe. I appreciate very much, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, um, first because uh, we all know that uh, Basel and Switzerland is located uh, in a very good uh, place. Uh, over 95% of the European population, uh, 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 they, they live in the distance uh, less than 1,000 kilometers from here. So this is very, very important if we know exactly what doesn't mean the time. Next, we should uh, to um, promote the Dynamics idea in different modes in different countries, European countries. Next, we, we we start uh, searching for donors and for patients at the same time, and at the end. But uh, I hope uh, sooner than later we should searching for the storage location in, in, in European Union. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christoph.